hello everyone it's so nice to get to see all of you here today for the keynote lecture and kickoff of our webinar series on the road to totalitarianism this will be our last webinar series of 2022 we have so many surprises in store for 2023 as well but i'm very very happy that we're closing off 2022 with a bang and with such great participation and I'm extremely happy to and proud of our cooperation with the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes for these keynote lectures and I would really like to thank Wojtek and Josef whom you will have the possibility of meet and interact with in well throughout today and also in uh, the next couple of sessions and I want to thank them very very much for helping us create such an interesting and engaging program I can't wait to see what's going to happen in the next month or so. And I'm extremely happy to welcome our speaker for today. Our speaker is Adela Yurichova. Adela is a member of the Czech Academy of Science, and she will talk with us about the theory of totalitarianism and the communist dictatorship in Czechoslovakia. She's so much more than this, and I'm just going to give her the floor so that she can get us started. Adela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed for this kind introduction, and thanks to everybody for, for being here. And, you know, it's a great pleasure for me to join the Eurocleo gang and and share a few ideas with the most important people on earth and that's history teachers obviously so everybody should see the opening slide of my presentation today i take over the title of the road to totalitarianism but this is the outline so what i'm gonna do is a very brief introduction into the theory of totalitarianism otherwise we could have a few keynotes on that only but i'll try to really apply it or ask about applying it to the situation of post-war Czechoslovakia. So I'll first talk about the immediately post-war period of Czechoslovakia, even before the communist dictatorship was founded. Then I'll go through how it actually happened that even Czechoslovakia, you know, a democratic stronghold in interwar Europe, got a communist government and how it actually worked. So I'll really not talk too much about the opposition to the Communist Party. I'll not talk about everyday life too much. I'll really stick to the political system and how it functioned, how it worked. I'll also talk about an example, at least, of a crisis of the dictatorship and the Communist Party's response, and try to ask a more general question about current democracy and its fragility or being safe. The theory of totalitarianism had a historical reason to arise. So as you can see the names and years of their first publications about these special kinds of states, it's all around the year 1940-45. It's all names that come from Europe it's mostly, you know, it was mostly Jewish refugees from Europe, people who fled from the Holocaust, landed either in the United Kingdom or the United States and thought about their situation. So I think it's a very inspiring theory in the sense that it's simply smart people, you know, very smart people who went through something special historically and tried to turn it into theory. If we are supposed to take a very simple definition, then totalitarian theory basically claims that there is a new kind of state, so-called totalitarian state, which can get hold of all the authority over the society, all the layers of, of political life and all aspects of private life too. To give an example, a perfect totalitarian society or system was in fact depicted in George Orwell's 1984 novel, you know, with the big brother screen really watching us from every room and now and at night and, and all the time. But, but the theory is, you know, goes in different directions. So I'm just mentioning the names. Friedrich took the, the connection between planned economy and totalitarian government. So that's also where, where the title of this lecture comes from. His road to serfdom claims exactly that. Once you start planning economy, you continue to plan other aspects of people's lives and end up in a dictatorship. Karl Popper started with the positive image of the open society and depicted its enemies. And I want to say a bit more about Hannah Arendt, who is, for me, the most interesting example. She also wrote, you know, the longest text and the most difficult text. It's very difficult to use it with students, I would say. But Hannah Arendt, on the other hand, was the clearest and most general in saying 
there was something historically new about totalitarianism in the 20th century. Somehow, these are completely new forms of government, new kinds of dictatorships, and not versions of the old, you know, tyrannies that we used to know. And what is new about them is an existence of a mass party, of this overwhelming ideology, and somehow also this general support that you need to preserve a totalitarian government, which is also based, and that was another sort of obsession of Hannah Arendt, on a different, on a new self-perception of the individual. You may know her story uh, around the trial of Adolf Eichmann later in the 50s in Israel, and that was exactly where she started to speak about the banality of evil. She started to really analyze the whole situation in concentration camps and so on, and I think she was super true but or super right, but also absolutely unacceptable for the public of that time. So somehow I think she and her version of totalitarianism is really the deepest we can go, but it's very difficult to apply it to, you know, any current, any contemporary society. Now, the criticism, the academic criticism of the totalitarian theory is also vast, and it's based on that the state and the regimes that Arendt and company described as totalitarian, and that means Nazi Germany or, or Stalinist Soviet Union, in fact, evolved in time. They changed, and they were never such a monolith as we would actually read in George Orwell's 1984. And the other weakness was that the totalitarian paradigm basically sees these dictatorships as dichotomic. There is this evil big brother regime versus this good oppressed society. And that's something what everybody with an experience in a communist dictatorship has to sort of oppose. It's never that simple. And it can be that simple in a, you know, partial situation, but never about the state as a whole. And so I will offer a slightly different description of how the communist dictatorship worked in the country I come from, in Czechoslovakia at that time, and we'll see where it comes together and meets. I said I have to start even before the communist dictatorship with Czechoslovakia. The reason is that Europe really sort of appeared in a completely new setting after 1945, after the Second World War. All over Europe, there were left-wing reforms realized. You know, Great Britain lies its mining, and, and it was not an excep exception. And the reason for that was that all governments in Europe believed that we may not sort of repeat the old errors, the old mistakes of interwar era, so that we do not ask for yet another Great Depression. So there was a really strong left-wing inclination all over Europe. And also this idea of a new world being established and the governments really contributing to the world turning out anew was very strong. Czechoslovakia was a part of that. And in addition to that, it was a sort of border country between West, the, the Western liberators and allies and the Soviet Union in the East. By the way, part of the territory, a much smaller part, had been, had been liberated by the U.S. Army, and a much larger part of the country was liberated and, in fact, occupied in, in May 1945 by the Soviet Union, by May 1945. The Czechoslovak version of the New World, as I call it, was the so-called National Revolution. Many or several parties of the interwar political spectrum agreed at the end of World War II that they would set up a completely new system of government, a new regime in Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was also re-established in 1945. This new regime was, I mean, as political scientists would, would describe it, not a full democracy. It was a limited democratic system because these parties that made the deal, in fact, excluded the other players. And they also excluded many opposing voices in the um, public discussion. So they said that in order to keep, to re-establish uh, new democratic Czechoslovakia, they in fact need to limit the democracy, to restrict something that they had known from interwar democracy and organization of the economy. So it was a very nationalist policy that they pushed through, and that it was once again very left-wing. So socialist reforms had been a part of pre-communist Czechoslovakia, 
you know, the nationalization of mining, many heavy industries, large estates, but also the media, for example, had been carried out well before establishing the communist dictatorship. The Communist Party was a very important player in the system. And that's, that's surprising because before World War II, the Communist Party was really a wild protest party, which was successful in the most impoverished, in mining regions and so on. It was a very radical party. So it had a parliamentary representation, but on the other hand, it was simply not an ally of anybody. It had zero coalition potential and all that. So what was new about the post-war era was also that the Communist Party was part of that deal of those several political parties. And I would say it was the most important part. So somehow the Communist Party, who now came out as one of the allies, one of the winners, Stalin was the winner, right? And they were Stalinist. Stalinists. So they join the Czechoslovak scene in that new position. And in addition to that, they were very moderate in their rhetoric and ideology in these three years. So you would hardly recognize them because they were nationalists. And I would say maybe even less radical than the social Democrats, for example, they were seemingly really acceptable. Uh, one of the consequences was that in the Czech part of Czechoslovakia, the Communist Party won the election, the, the, the last general election of 1946, the last before the communist takeover. So their road to the communist dictatorship was actually very well managed and not recognized as a road to dictatorship by many key players of Czechoslovak politics. And the last bullet here speaks about major social transfers, by which I mean the nationalizations, manipulations. But what I mean by that, or what I want to include, is also an ethnic cleansing case, which Czechoslovakia very consciously carried out. And that was the expulsion of the German minority from Czechoslovakia. These German-speaking people, people of German origin, were mostly populating the borderlands, these mountainous borderlands of the Czech lands. There were as many as three out of 10 million approximately of the inhabitants of the Czech lands. And so, so once again, it was almost a third of the population of the Czech lands. And all these people, basically, I mean, there were exceptions, and but... That was not a, a decisive part. All these people were deprived of their citizenship. They were deprived of their property, of all civic rights. And they were really put on trains. And I want to show you a few. So these are a few images of members of the German community. Once again, these people were no incomers of the Nazi era. Their families had lived in the Czech lands and then Czechoslovakia for centuries, basically, for many generations. And now they were suddenly declared non-citizens and could pack a little suitcase and have to go. I know that that Vojta and Josef will go into the ethnic minority thing in much more depth. I just wanted to, to mention it and also to show some of these statistics. If you take a minute to see the results of the national censuses, then you really have these are percent sense. So for the Czech lands, you can see the almost a third of German speaking people in the 1930s. And then suddenly in 1950, these people are gone. So what I want to say is this was an extreme change that or extreme shift that the Czech lands went through. And that obviously had to have the political effect. The expulsion took place in 1945 and 1946. And new people were moved and moving into the borderlands. The borderlands can today be seen, the former Sudetenland can be seen on any statistical map until today. If you follow deaths, a uh, number of deaths uh, caused by COVID-19, or if you see, you know, election results, the map always sees a different or shows different colors in these former German populated areas. There's one more example from, it comes from a student project, the so-called Disappeared Sudetenland, and these students about 15 years ago actually photographed the same places that, that used to be depicted on these romantic postcards. So this is an example from Western Bohemia near the spa city of Karlsbad, which you may have heard about. 
and and you can see this this completely deserted place you know a village which simply did not stay alive so it used to be a german populated village and there's a you know mountainous hut there now this was about the immediately post-war era and what i wanted to say by that was that the context was really radical. The communists were able to manipulate the situation, but the, this radical context really contributed to how easy it was to grasp all government. February 1948 is the date when a cabinet crisis ended with appointing a communist prime minister president and basically reorganizing all institutions in favor of the Communist Party. This was also when the Stalinist restructuring of Czechoslovakia started. So when I said there were radical policies there, even after 1945, now this is radical because the communist, the Stalinist phase of communist government was really a mix of, of policies at many levels and in many places at the same time. So I'm just mentioning censorship, you know, complete control of media infiltration and once again grasping control of all public administration of all manufacturing of all trade but even of religious organizations closing down the borders and so on at the same time you would have far-reaching economic policies so nationalization of, of everything basically all everything from tenant houses via small shops of any sort to of course any manufacturing was introducing the central planning, all these two-year and five-year plans. So somehow supposedly rationalizing manufacturing and consumption by saying what the population needs and what we need to produce for it. The collectivization of agriculture was an especially cruel and once again far-going transformation of the country by abolishing small farms, forcing people, small and big farms, forcing all these farmers to join uh, the so-called collective farms and basically joining little farms into large state-run ones. I'm also mentioning persecution of churches, of independent intellectuals, of business owners who didn't want to happily give up their business, of landowners, of people trying to cross the border, there were purges in the public sector, even in the Communist Party itself. And on the other hand, and that's where I'm saying it's never just a dictatorship as we would imagine it from Orwell, let's say, there were benefits for certain segments of the society. Yes, party members, you can imagine, but also for the working class. Now, there were the former, what, for example, noble palace in the countryside were turned into recreation facilities for worker workers' families or summer camps of their children. The petty farmers, for them, joining the cooperatives was simply a good thing. They didn't have to go through the drudgery only now. They really would be or would also benefit from the vast public services offered. Here are a few images to show the mood, the so-called socialist construction campaign. You can see the sort of co-educated, happy contribution to the national restructuring. There is all also an emancipatory, I mean, women's emancipatory side to the phase of communism, women joining the labor force. And here you see these female welders in Slovakia in a new factory built by the new communist state and women being a part of it. And on the other hand, you have women as victims of show trials. So Milada Horakova being the most famous one because she really was executed in 1951 in spite of being an active politician of a non-communist party, a women's movement activist, a very smart, moderate woman, and yet the communist party considered her so dangerous. Ruzhena Vatskova on the right is just another example of a Catholic intellectual, an art historian and classical archaeologist who dared to organize students' discussions and home lectures after she was expelled from university. You can see she spent over 16 years in prison. She's one of the longest serving political prisoners. And now, because I promised to speak about how it worked, then I have to say it's simply more complicated. I talked about the effects, about policies, but how do you organize it? So first of all, sometimes we talk about a democratic facade or something like that. I pref prefer to call it legality image. 
Czechoslovakia, even under the Communist Party government, had a constitution. And there were several constitutions passed by the communist-dominated parliament, which existed. There were elections taking place, and you'll hear much more about that in one of the following sessions, I understand. There were freedoms guaranteed by law. There were all these, as if, you know, institutional parts that you have with a democratic state. And yet, you had all the propaganda show trials, but even the show trials had the form of a trial, right? There was a form, formally, there was a defendant and so on. And the question is, why would you pretend to all that? And that is a question that I must say, I really asked quite seriously in my research, because it seems like a very expensive fun. No one in the West actually bought that the communist states were democratic, right? So why would you organize a parliament and, you know, pretend the elections and whatever. And my explanation of that is that the Communist Party actually really organized a very complex two-pillar system. It had a structure of the government institutions from the national government and parliament and all that through down to municipal administration and all that. And next to that, it had a pillar of the communist organs, sort of institutions that copied the levels and even copied the agendas of government, copied the departments, copied ministries and so on. But that doesn't help, right? It doesn't explain why you would actually do that. And I offer the explanation of that the Communist Party, I mean, first of all, first it didn't know, but later it learned from crises and it was able to sort of redraw attention to the governmental pillar when it needed. So when it came to the 1960s and de-Stalinization was sort of expected, even from Czechoslovakia, which didn't carry it out in 1956, as many other countries did, the Communist Party said, oh, we have this parliament and government and we should strengthen their role, right? Because now we have this expert knowledge about and technocratic management and all that. So why doesn't the government and parliament actually improve and professionalize and all that? So I suggest that the Communist Party was able to redirect attention to the governmental pillar when uh, losing support. And I want to sort of prove it on the 1968 events. You probably know that this was the deepest crisis in Czechoslovakia. It started in January 1968 with Alexander Dubček becoming the first secretary, the leader of the Communist Party. The events that followed are usually mm, labeled so-called Prague Spring. The project that the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia offered is called Socialism with a Human Face. And it was supposed to build on a more humane sort of or humanistic um, idea of Marxism taken from early Marxist works. It uh, involved certain economic reforms with some market elements being let in the socialist economy. It also involved the emancipation of Slovaks, because I have not mentioned that there were some Czechs and some Slovaks living in the country, and the Slovaks were definitely not happy about this unitary government of communist Czechoslovakia, and they managed to reach uh, Czechoslovakia being turned into a federation during 1968. And there was also a cultural liberalization. You know, censorship was relaxed and really removed in the summer of 1968. The travel ban was also sort of interrupted. So the, the changes somehow originated in the Communist Party. At the same time, the society really reacted to this de-Stalinizing call, I would say. Only that the Soviet Union reacted in an unbelievably strict or cruel manner by organizing an invasion, a military invasion in August 1968. Now, why am I speaking about that as a proof of what I had previously said? And let me just show you a few photos from 1968. So on the first photo on the left, the smiling guy is the new uh, Communist Party leader. And you can see all the smiles around him. So somehow the reaction to somebody a bit nicer than the previous leaders was really uh, endorsed by people. And the second photo of a lady showing a photo of Alexander Dubček and President Svoboda to the Soviet occupying soldiers is, I would say, really painful. And this is another image of these elegant 68ers of Prague, the, the lady in a miniskirt, and the tanks in the very center of Prague. 
But here is the photo that I'm heading for. This crowd of people is actually National Assembly members, deputies, who came together at the moment of invasion. This is a day after the invasion started. And they came together. They were, in fact, isolated in a building in Prague. And they organized a session of the National Assembly in which they try to appeal to the parliaments of other countries, of the countries that took part in the invasion. And they sort of called for help and declared themselves to be a sovereign representative of Czechoslovakia. And what I want to say is that here, most of the people, once again, were Communist Party members, very often reform-minded communists. But here, the Communist Party, once again, redirected attention to the governmental pillar to parliament in this case and the parliament reacted to it and took the responsibility and when the leaders of the communist party who had been kidnapped by the soviet army and took to moscow when they were left here so they acted as a real parliament so in these deep crises the governmental pillar sort of was revived and showed its legitimacy all that only that what followed was another 20 years of a communist dictatorship most achievements of the Prague Spring were lost. I would say all achievements except for the federalization of Czechoslovakia. Almost 100,000 people left the country because the borders were still semi-open. I mean, you could still go on an official occasion abroad and many people stayed out. There was a massive purge in the Communist Party and the censorship was reintroduced media, cultural life, all that was once again under control. All the economic reforms were forgotten, the travel ban was back there. And yet, it is not another Stalinist establishment because the strategy was different. The Communist Party somehow learned from the crisis and focused on something else. It focused on offering some consumer gains to the society. It introduced new um, social benefits. It really managed to produce a baby boom of in the 1970s, one of the baby boomers, I have to say. It, on the other hand, it also changed the way how you were supposed to support the communist government. You were not, unlike in, I mean, back in the 1950s, you were really supposed to sort of widely join in and whoever would not do that very openly, uh, who did not seem to be a very devoted supporter of the socialist reconstruction, was really suspicious, sort of. In the last two decades of Czechoslovak socialism, it is enough to show just a very basic, very formal support. You know, just go to elections, not do anything that you just, maybe I'll show a photo. Well, I'll, I'll just mention a concept of so-called privatized citizenship, which the Communist Party now allowed. It sort of allowed that people lived relatively simple private life without the Communist Party directly organizing it. And this is what I mean. This is the propaganda of the 1970s with a happy family, a happy nuclear family in an, obviously a new apartment with this luxury socialist furniture and with this handsome mummy serving a cake to a newspaper reading daddy. It's so different from the welders, from the, the manufacturing centered, industrialization centered Stalinism. And there is another one. It's a lovely photo by Lubomir Kotek. So this is a real communist rally, most probably an anniversary of the great October revolution that school kids are supposed to join in. And they do wear the pioneer uniforms. They have these red flags and they do carry the red star banners. But you would, I would think this must be a joke. They simply don't feel like being too present and certainly not too convinced about what they do. But this is a wonderful depiction of the 1970s and 80s in what the Communist Party asked from people. So it somehow asked people to show up, but let them think and do things, other things over the weekend, I would say. And it's a completely different question what, you know, make the shifts shift to this revolutionary crowd. This is 1980, 89, November, and these crowds on Venceslas Square suddenly toppling the communist government. It's a completely different question of how the opposition energy was basically collecting, and I can't go into that. 
I just wanted to say that the Communist Party was very flexible. It was able to change policies. It was able to, once again, sort of redirect attention of people, redirect the propaganda, completely change its content, and that served very well. So if I want to provoke, I would say that the communist dictatorship was a very stable and well-functioning political system because, because it really produced the 40 years of a very difficult economic and political system. And the implications, I want to very briefly comment on these. So was the totalitarian theory useful for what I was saying? Well, I was really taking a different perspective. But once again, I do expect, I do admire the totalitarian theory as a reaction to personal histories. I think it was a great intellectual reflection of what its authors had been through. Then by showing the complexity and also flexibility of communist party policy, I want to throw in the question that maybe it really left too little space for opposition. In the 50s, there was no space whatsoever because it simply really locked up everybody and sometimes executed everybody who would organize something. And in the 70s and 80s, it was simply offering so much space for the non-opposition citizens that there was only very little left for real opposition. And these people were very isolated and there were a few of them and so on. And then the third question is, how come Czechoslovakia actually turned into a dictatorship? And I know there is, of course, this sort of international reason of Stalin considering Czechoslovakia part of its zone of interest. There were also internal factors. And I think these factors were major pressures going on in society and this complete re-establishing of the hope, of the frame frame of debate, then I think there is a sec second thing which makes democracy fragile. And here I really want to say this is an implication for the current situation as well. If you try to get rid of your opponents by limiting the scope of debate, limiting or restricting the number of options and positions, and that's exactly what Czechoslovakia did in 1945. And I think it simply did not pay off. And then I want to say I understand that we are in a very special setting today. So the first condition of major pressures and this concept of a special sort of exceptional situation definitely works for our world today. But I think the best thing to do is to learn and teach about history without simplifications. That's the best way to avoid yet a crash of democracy. And then I also hope for yet another Hannah Arendt to appear, who would actually be able to turn our current experience into a feasible theory. Thanks for doing the first job teaching about democracy. And I'm really keen to hear your questions. Thanks for your attention. Of course. Thank you so, so much for this presentation. I personally am supposed to have studied the history of Central and Eastern European Europe and Southern Eastern Europe when I was at university, but I have learned so much and I am so happy of the, of the conversation that you set up. And I think that we have set up the tone for our next session in a quite clear way. I promise before starting that I would have many questions and I do have a couple of questions for you, but I would like to give the floor to our participants first to react to your keynote lecture and to ask any questions that they, they might have. Yes, thank you. So this was a very interesting way of looking at the situation because from, from the viewpoint of Estonia, we always kind of concentrate on the evil of the socialist system or, or something. So the positive aspects oftentimes get lost in the telling. So I was thinking about these images from 50s, these women welders, and then the later picture of this very housewife serving their family. And I was kind of thinking it's sort of going back to old traditions. So was there going back to all this chains in the old women, like going back to being housewives or, or something like that in Czechoslovakia? So could you say that was there kind of women losing their role that they had gained during the Soviet system or, or time emancipation in some ways mm -hmm. and, and looking at the 80s or, or today or something like that? Mm -hmm. Maybe let's collect also, I see a question from Jill and a question from Paolo, and then we can start with these three questions and away we will go. So I think Jill. 
Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And I agree. I, I don't often, I mean, obviously I'm in South Africa, so we're very far away. But for me, obviously we teach the Cold War and we teach the period after the Second World War, that whole period of, of Eastern Europe and so on, but not with any kind of detail. But what interests me really, I've never thought of the Soviet period as being stable because it's forced. So that take that you just dropped in at the end was so interesting. I think it's such a great thing to put into a discussion with, uh, with students about the fact that could we talk about stability? But the real question that I wanted to ask was around the Germans, the expelling, where were those, what happened to what I'm going to call the refugees? Because you said it was 3 million people. I mean, where did they go? Thank you. Thank you, Jill and Paolo. Oh, my question is, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it was a really interesting presentation and I appreciate it very much. And my question is related to the, uh, the previous one. Because the, the German expulsion happened in, in 45, 47, in a period in which more or less the debate was open, the question is, there was any, any opposition to, to the expulsion? There was a debate uh, on it or, or all the, the parties were agreed? Uh, this is my question. Thank you. These are all great questions and you were really great listeners, only that I was not a very good speaker because what I wanted to say was really not that I would deny the community dictatorship was, was evil, you know, and cruel to people. I could give you examples from my narrowest family or from friends' lives being devastated. I just took the perspective of the system, how it worked, because I believe into the analytical power of historiography. So let me just to make that very clear. And I'm sure that, that Wojta and Josef will make that ever clearer because, because they're simply more, I mean, better trained to have these 40 minutes sessions, whereas we as, you know, historians, researchers really need 40 hours. As to Tatu's question on the gender order of socialism, I just threw these photos in because that's something that is of a special interest for me. And it's it, there really is a great shift during the communist era. The, the 1950s were a very radical phase in really asking a total restructuring of the gender order. So it really asked women to give up the household, to join the labor force, to also family was at that time suggested as an outdated institution. So it seemed the communist ideal would be living in these collective houses where there would be all public like services offered. There would be a public dining room and a public kindergarten, a public everything. And, and family would not really preserve all the roles that it used to have. Of course, this had an emancipatory effect on women. So there was a very early, you know, very liberal and how to say that, I mean, a very emancipatory law, family law approved by the Communist Party. By the way, Milada Horakova, the, the woman who was on trial and who had been executed. So she was the author of a draft of the law that the Communist Party then, then really approved. So women gained equal status in the family. Women really would have an independent life much earlier than in Western Europe. And that's, that's very interesting. Women could get abortion much earlier, you know, illegal abortion much earlier than, than in Western Europe. And then on the other hand, the late socialist era, the, the last 20 years or the, the second 20 years of Czechoslovak communism were sort of a, a restoration era in the sense that when the communist regime pragmatically redrew attention to family life and it offered, you know, once again, these nice little apartments with this nice little family bubble. It, of course, was a more conservative policy when it came to women's emancipation. So, you know, on the other hand, women had been emancipated. This mummy with a cake, this elegant lady there, had a full-time job you know, in the 70s. So Western feminists used to admire the Soviet Union and communism for the level of emancipation, but they never understood that the whole discussion of second wave feminism on gender roles, on gendered language, on power included in the gender establishment was carried out in communism. So once again, communism did emancipate women. Women were very strong players in the family, but they never 
engage, I mean, the debate on the roles and on power and gender was not allowed in communism. And so the post-communist period was a complete mess because there was a big effect of really conservative policies, you know, trying to draw women back to household and care, child care. And at the same time, you had these emancipated women who used to have a full-time job for several generations and so on. So that is a very complex issue, but you were quite right in, in the difference between the 50s and the 70s. And then Jill's and Paolo's questions about the Germans. Technically speaking, these people, you know, were taken by trains to what came to be Germany and Austria, which was a war destroyed areas, not really very welcoming. So there are many memories published these days about the trauma of these people being expelled from their old homeland and homes and not being very friendly, not getting a very friendly welcome on the other side, understandably quite. But they have become a German and Austrian citizens, citizens of both Germanys, but West Germany mostly. And the question about whether there was an open debate during the expulsion is very interesting. And thanks for asking it, because that's exactly it. There was not a free debate about that. You know, the post-war Czechoslovakia was really limiting the discussion. It was such a nationalist fast train that you could not really ask it's like eh, how come they don't have a citizenship now you know if they had it before the war how come these people are supposed to leave if they had lived here for several generations so there were tiny little exceptions of intellectuals somehow changing the expulsion but it was very rare and the state policy was like now we know we have to do this to save Czechoslovakia and its nation very cruel, but it's, I would say, is the key to also accepting the communist dictatorship once you limit the discussion to such an extent. Thank you, Adela, for the reply. I think we have time for another couple of questions. I see a first hand raised by, by Nadia. Yes, thank you very much um, for the lecture. I have a question of understanding. I'm sorry if I misunderstood something, but I was, if I heard it right, I feel that uh, I would ask you to repeat how you would deal with the concept of totalitarianism because I was a little bit surprised because in my understanding totalitarianism I would apply it to certain periods of communist regime not saying that yeah whole periods of communist regime was totalitarianism and for me this really specific understanding that I have from my education background in Germany is that it's an ideology supported by broadly by the society, by the population, and that it goes into every aspect of life, so also private life and so on. So it, for me, the difference to more broader category of authoritarianism, it's, you know, that it affects so many spaces of life and that it's so supported and by the whole population. And that's why I also hear it currently often trying to apply to the current situation of the Russian state. And I would like to ask you what you think about the concept then. Can we use it currently? Mm -hmm. You think it is useful for certain communist periods? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think because I was trying to be brief, I was simplifying it. And then maybe Wojta will also comment on that. The theory of totalitarianism, of course, arose from comparing, you know, Nazi Germany and Stalinist Soviet Union. Only later, and that was also because of really history disciplines being established. So, for example, the American Sovietology sort of tried to apply it to all of socialism and their whole histories. It is also a case with of anti-communist discourse in public discussion. And it would be still the case in the Czech Republic today. So there would be many journalists who would still use the word totalitarian for anything connected with Czechoslovakia before 1989 and anything connected with Russia since ever. So somehow there is also this vague concept of it. And the question whether I would apply it. So I definitely think it is... For me, it's mostly a sort of, it's a history. You know, for me, the, the rise of the totalitarian theory is really a reaction to the Holocaust and Stalinism. And I think it's a very interesting, intriguing intellectual reaction. But I don't find it very useful for analyzing Czechoslovak communism, you know. Yes, I would sort of accept it for the Stalinist era, but I see it as, as a too complex and too different from the totalitarian ideal 
which is not an ideal at all. And would I apply it to today's Russia? No, I would not. You know, I simply think you can't have, I know about all the authoritarian characteristics of today's Russia. I know about all the politicization of its economy and so on, but I still do not consider it a totalitarian state because I'm not even sure that we can have a totalitarian state today. And I would very much like Wojta, who is used to speaking about totalitarianism much more than I am, to comment on this. Thank you, but I would rather restrict to, to a question or kind of request that maybe the only sentence about totalitarianism would refer to the way you have used the, the word useful, because by and large, I suppose it was not meant and shouldn't be used as a label, but rather as a model or ideal type that you use as a heuristic device to compare uh, it with some real uh, system or a real country, and then you, you're looking for differences. And then the, the right measure is usefulness rather than this is totalitarian or is not. And I suppose there might be a reasonable discussion about its usefulness when it comes to certain regimes, whether it opens your mind, opens your sensitivity toward important details and so on. But I would kindly ask Adela uh, if you might just summarize in what aspects uh, you see the Czechoslovak communist dictatorship as extraordinary, special, and in what aspects we might look at it as bearing a more general traits shared by other communist dictatorships elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very interesting one, and I'm not prepared to it at all. I would say what is certainly special about Czechoslovakia is the, the timing. Lack of destalinization in the mid-1950s is really striking. So somehow, whereas in the Soviet Union you were releasing political prisoners and you were changing the rhetoric to a large extent, in Czechoslovakia, we would still erect a huge statue of Stalin in the late 1950s, for example. So the absence of destalinization is certainly a specialty. Then this very destalinization in 1968 was in another, in a different aspect, and that is that it actually joined with the Western 1968. So somehow there was much more of a link between the student protests in Paris and at the Californian universities who were aware of the Prague Spring and who sometimes even knew the, the name Dubček and knew there was something similar happening in Czechoslovakia. And as for the late phase, I think in that case, it was interesting that once again, even the Perestroika, the Gorbachev-inspired reforms, came very late and relatively tamely in Czechoslovakia. So whereas Poland and Hungary and its communist parties were really trying to negotiate some reforms with the opposition, the Czechoslovak Communist Party was not. And there was a different trajectory of the change. Like that stole my question. So would you say in some sense that the communist government or the communist party was more successful than elsewhere in some sense? I wouldn't know. The only thing that I was trying to say is that it was successful. You know, and that's what I provoke the whole public with. I'm aware of that. It may seem that I'm sort of defending them or something like that. And I'm not doing that. Please understand me well. But I would say it was surprisingly successful. In this country, the country did not break up. It broke up immediately afterwards. The Communist Party was able to, to somehow survive 1968 and a military invasion. Somehow they managed. And I, as a political historian, I see the key in the two pillars, in actually having something else but just the Communist Party. But that's a very partial perspective. Thank you, Wojtek, for the question. And thank you, Adela, for the answer. I'm sure we will also eviscerate this question much more also in the upcoming session. I hope we have time for our last question because I see a raised hand. So I suggest maybe we take this last question and then any other questions that come up, feel free to email them to me and I will use them for our brand new uh, clear newsletter feature of the question of the month. And thank you for the very good uh, presentation and uh, what i have to ask is uh, what happened with members after the invasion of 68 of, uh, what was their reaction okay we can understand that a part of them collaborated like to say with military but uh, what happened really and what was uh, perceived that in in czechoslovakia 
That's a very complex one, but the, the invasion was planned as a joint Warsaw Pact event, but, but some countries immediately say, said they would not take part, for example, Romania, and some other countries, some other governments, in fact, broke off at the beginning of the invasion. So I would say that, for example, the East German part in the invasion was really symbolic more than anything. And most of the invasion was, was carried out by Soviet troops. As for the political effect of the invasion, I would say that there was, I mean, within Czechoslovakia, there was definitely a lot of, I would call it a political depression, really. I think that it was a naive belief because the Socialism of the Human Face project was not really planned to establish a multi-party government or whatever. And yet people used the maximum space offered by the reforms to really introduce a bit of a free society into socialism. And they hope they might survive with that blend. And when that collapsed, they really fell into a depression. But once again, I think that the Communist Party was somehow able to combine the early oppression of the reformers who were fired from their jobs and, of course, deprived of their positions and so on, and these consumer gains to build up a very quiet and unvoluntary support, but still support. Once again, they survived another 20 years. You can't do that with just a tank parked at the park. Prague Castle and the tank was not parked. There were military bases of the Soviet army all over the country, but I would not say that people understood their lives to really be held by the tanks throughout the period. So somehow these, this redirecting the focus of the propaganda and building up another image of, of socialism was somehow successful. But on the other hand, you know, I am a generation of these baby boomers and at the end of the 1980s, I was ready to die, but not willing to live in socialism. So we were definitely fed up with that quiet support of our parents or something like that. But just in the sense of vulnerability versus stability of the regime, somehow they managed a very quiet 20 years. Thank you, Gantia, for the question. Thank you, Adela, for the answer. I think this proves once again that we're barely scratching the surface. There are so many directions in which we could go. I'm going to list them all because this session is recorded. And so this is me making notes for future sessions. We could talk about the use of information or the lack of information to within communist and totalitarian regimes. We could talk about everyday life. We could talk about how the events were perceived in other parts of the world. There's so many participants not from continental Europe in this session today. And I would be so curious to know how you also teach about these events, if you teach about them at all. I am so excited for what's to come and so sad that we need to unfortunately bring this session to a close for now. I am going to do something a little bit different. So I'm going to start with the announcement and then do the official closing of the session, just because I really want this to end with a final note from Adela and a nice, nice round of applause. We have officially opened pre-registrations to our annual conference. So check that out. We're going to talk about the complexity of history and how do we go about unpacking the past. So I think our topic today is quite on point for what will be our focus for 2023. And I would really like to thank you all for participating to our session today. Thank you, Adela, so, so much for hosting this session. It was a great way to get us started. And I would really like to close off by giving you the floor if you want to share a last couple of words before we go back to our cooking dinner, most likely, for most of the people <laughs> that are connected here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. You know, I want to say once again that I consider history teachers being probably the most important people in the world, and I'm honored by how open you were in letting me share my unorthodox views about communism. Thanks very much for today. Thank you, everyone. Have a great, great evening, and see you next week. Bye-bye.